Hi, this is Charlie Peck for the Thriving School Community Podcast. I am so grateful to be here. We have an excellent guest. Of course we do. This is the kind of show where we have to always have high-valued guests. So we have Michelle Osterhout today. And Michelle, I'm going to introduce you um, for someone who has a tremendous lens in education and improving the school mental health system. So please welcome and then just share a little bit about what your lens is like for us. Sure. So hi, everybody. Michelle Osterhout, and I am residing in Catskills, upstate New York, and I'm the superintendent of Margaretville Central School District. Um, my lens is opportunity and equity for all. And honestly, I don't want to sound like beating a dead horse, but right, we talk about student needs and we have to meet their needs before they're able to learn. So one of the things I like to tell people is that I didn't love the pandemic, but during the pandemic, we focused on the basic needs of kids. At least I did in, you know, in my school community. And that's really what I'm all about. So anything that brings equity and brings opportunity to kids is my jam. Um, so right now, I think that we're seeing that kids are so dysregulated. We need to take care of them first. We need to love them. Sometimes we need to feed them. We need to clothe them and we need to be a listening ear. So that's where I come from. And we can talk more about it as we go throughout the show. But that's what I'm all about is just getting kids to feel comfortable and give them opportunities in school. Well, that's really key right there. Giving them opportunities to feel comfortable in school. If they're not feeling comfortable, they're not going to want to be there, as we all know. So tell me, Michelle, how equity plays such a vital role in school mental health for kids. Yeah, so it's really about access. And so, you know, I think one of the things that I can tell you that I noticed as a leader coming out of the pandemic, so during the pandemic, which by the way, I will tell you in my old district, a lot of my teachers will tell you that it was one of their best teaching years ever. And I'm going to explain that in just a moment because our focus was bringing kids back to school. And I was my former district. I was the principal of an elementary school and we didn't, we didn't close down at all that, that, that year. We didn't close down at all. We were open all year. In fact, we were featured on the news because we didn't close down at all. Yeah. And the reason why teachers say it was, you know, why some of my teachers would tell you that it was one of the best years is because it was all about getting kids to school, making sure they were safe, caring for them, their basic needs, and just loving them, right? So just loving them and being there for them. So that was our focus, right? So then fast forward to the 2020, 2021 school year, it was a lot of the focus. And I think most of us can attest to this was learning loss, right? And we're still dealing with that now and all those things that, oh, we gotta, we gotta make sure that they're getting a guaranteed and viable curriculum. We have to make sure that they're not falling behind. And our focus became a lot of academic focus right? So we were feeling the pressure and I think teachers were burned out and kids were, some kids in a lot of districts were dysregulated because they had been out a lot of the time on remote learning all year. So, you know, I took pieces from the 2020 year and the 2021 year. And when I think of myself as a leader, I think about how we have to get back to making sure that, yeah, we want to teach kids, but you and I were just talking about this before we, we hit record. None of that matters if they're not in the space to learn, right? If they don't have some of their basic needs met. So um, true story, my board of education, my entire board and I visited a neighboring school that has a health, a school-based health center. And my dream is to bring a school-based health center to my school. And there's a number of reasons why I want to do that. Number one, because it gives kids access to quality health care, but two, a component of a school-based health center is the mental health component. So that comes in with the, the school-based health center. And we're very fortunate. So I'm gonna share some statistics with you that might actually freak your audience out. So my school district, 333 kids, right? Very fortunate to have two school counselors and a social worker and a CPS worker. And now we're talking about bringing in a school-based health center. In addition to our school nurse, we would have a nurse in our health center access to a primary care physician and a mental health clinic. So talk wow. about wrap around care yes. in, in a school for kids. So yes. that's what I'm excited about because I get to come to this district, right? I'm a new superintendent and these, this is the work that I'm tasked with that not only we know is needed, my board supports. So that's, I, I can't wow. even tell you how excited I am that that's the priority for my district. Yeah. I mean, clearly it's a priority because they wouldn't put the resources that way. So the, the conversations there, the leadership is there 
And with your particular role, Michelle, it's really important that um, how you lead resonates to other leaders within your district, right? So what what do you do with people who don't share the same vision that you do? Or, or even, I, and the reason I say this, I just had a conversation with someone who is a superintendent who said that some of the principals are not actually on board with the SEL initiatives or the initiatives for mental health that they're leaning towards. And how do you work with leaders like that who are stuck? Yeah, so... You know, I'm very fortunate here, but I've, I've, and I haven't seen too much of people not wanting to work with the initiatives. I think the hard part is, is you have to make sure that everybody is vested and on board and understands the importance of it. So when I see people who are not invested, it's because they're not invested in maybe a cookie cut cutter um, version of that. And when I say that, I mean, so true story again, this morning I was talking to my executive principal, who's a new hire and I hired him. So I know it's a fit. <laughs> he He's speaking my language. We were talking about SEL and SEL curriculum, for example, because that's like a big push is people are having SEL curriculum. And I'm not saying that's a bad thing. In fact, we're piloting some curriculum right now, but I'm not sure, you know, that I've got buy-in from my staff. So I, we're piloting it. We want to see if it works, but what really needs to happen with something like that is you need to give them a say and maybe they need to vet it and they need to look into it. My 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 leadership team is on board. My leadership team understands the importance of SEL because really at the end of the day, when a child is difficult or when we're struggling with kids in the classroom, who deals with it is my administrators, right? So they're seeing all of this behavior and dealing a lot with families and parents. So they know the importance of making sure that a kid is taken care of. So I don't get a lot of pushback on that. I get pushback on things like, oh, we got to do another SEL curriculum. We hear about this SEL curriculum and how is that going to help me? But that comes from very intentional and purposeful training or, you know, sort of planting that seed, not forcing it upon somebody, but making sure that they understand the relevance of it and how it can help them in their classroom. So we're in the beginning phases of that. So I, I don't know if we've done it backwards. I don't think we've done it backwards because I don't think you would have the SEL curriculum before you would have SEL other things in place like counselors and social workers. And another thing our staff is, we're doing training on is TCI. So, you know, therapeutic crisis intervention yeah. so that the people know how to deal with kids who are dysregulated. So we have more and more than ever, right? So we hear people say, kids haven't changed but they have, and, and they've changed because the dynamics of our society has changed, whether it's the family structure, the family unit, um, you know, so how they're brought up has changed a little bit and how they are able to or not able to deal with a situation when they become dysregulated is, is something that we have to help them do. But first we have to not get dysregulated ourselves, right? So teachers and, and you know, even administrators sometimes get so frustrated with students because they're not behaving or responding in the way that we think they should, we have to remember that we have to teach them to do that because they may not have the capacity to do that. Yeah. Well, you were saying before too, that they're the ones dealing with a lot of those behaviors. And I think that there's just so much focus on student behaviors as the problem, but you and I both know that it's not the problem. It's the symptom of the problem. Yes. Right. And so when we go back to these kinds of trainings, it, let's see, one of the things that we always talk about, like what my partner and I do, Dr. Kim Caswell, is we've looked at all of those stats. We look at SEL. We think SEL is great. Restorative practice is great. All of these programs are great. The problem is, is the last 30 years, we've been implementing these kinds of programs and we still have a youth mental health crisis. Yeah. And then COVID hit, right? And then COVID hit. And so we were like, what is going on here? And so we've been talking to leaders. We've been talking to people. And that's why we, we say we've got to do something that fits within the teaching practice. It has to, we've got to get everybody on board. So I would love to know your thoughts about how do we equip everybody? How do we get everybody on board who's working with kids so that when they're dysregulated or even as a preventative approach, Michelle, how do we do that? What does that look like? So one of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in that we haven't done in, in this district so much, but we've started some restorative practice and some restorative circles. Honestly, it's really about getting down to the nitty gritty and having conversations, just putting it out there. And here's what I'm finding. 
people are not comfortable with that. Whether it's conversations about what's going on in society, right? We've got a whole bunch of things going on in society that make people angry and frustrated, whether it's with our government, whether it's with other society things that are going on. People don't know how to have those conversations. So really, it's going to take strong leaders who are willing to come in and maybe sometimes be a little vulnerable and share their story, but also just have conversations. Um, and I have to point out, I'm actually writing, working on an article about this right now. Being vulnerable doesn't mean sharing everything with everybody. I love that you just said that. Thank you. <laughs> right? <laughs> Thank so, you. because there's an appropriate yes. way to, to share. And, and I am very transparent. I share a lot of myself, and but I don't share that with everybody. And I don't share every detail with everybody, but enough to get the point across. It, it, it may be a situation. I love storytelling. So, a lot of the books that I read and uh, educational books that I read have to do with anecdotes or storytelling that can relate to a situation that I, you know, I can look up the situation and read about it and like, oh, that pertains to me and I love it. Um, so, that type of, you know, that kind of vulnerability and sharing your story and sharing what's going on. Um, I think that's the, honestly, I'm going to tell you that's the first step and that's the most important step because you can't push something down people's throats. You can't say, we're going to do this new curriculum and it's going to be great. You have to share why it's going to be great or share an experience that you might have had, um, if that makes any sense. It makes total sense. And I think this is where we need to talk about your work in civil rights and why it's so valuable for you to have that story inserted in the teachings that you do. Yeah. So thank you for bringing that up because, you know, I am an administrator of color in upstate New York. There are not a lot of people that that look like me in positions like mine. Hmm. Um, and I knew that it was a fit in my district. I'm not saying that they were looking for a person of color. They were certainly looking for diversity. But one of the things that I know that stood out to my board that they appreciated, which I valued so much, um, and I'll get into the, the personal reasons why, is because they loved the fact that I had a social justice background they loved the fact that I am was the NAACP vice president, now president-elect of my chapter. They really welcomed that. And that was so important to me because that wasn't always appreciated. And I'm not saying like my other districts didn't, you know, there were people that supported me in that, but I would hear a lot from community members or parents or teachers. I'd hear some background noise about, you know, what's my hidden um, political agenda, which by the way, a civil rights organization doesn't have a political agenda. Right. We just want civil rights uh, for all people. We want social justice and that is good for everybody. But, you know, I, I think about all of that vitriol that's being spewed in our country right now and why people just can't have civil discourse. That's a big part of it. But one of the things that my board wanted was someone who had some diverse thinking and background. And I'll tell you, not everybody knows this about me, but I'm pretty diverse. I, I'm, I'm not on one end of the spectrum or the other. I'm kind of in the middle. Okay. And I think that's a that's something that I have that's a, a plus. It, it, it allows me to have civil discourse with people who may have different views than I do. And that's super important in our jobs as leaders. Yeah. We can't be biased one way or another, right? Yeah, and um, a lot of people are. I think they, are, not everybody, but I think you're right. I think that is a huge barrier. And that's when that leader again, I don't want to be too blanketed here because it, it really yeah. is. It's not, but you're right. And, and some, it's a skill, like it truly is a skill to be able not only to check your own bias, but to also be able to mitigate that among people in your circle and the people that you are leading. So please expand upon that. I know you're going further with that. So I appreciate it, Michelle. Yeah. So I have to tell you, I wasn't always that way. So I have been in politics. I was a council member for my community. I ran on the Democrat line and I'm not trying to get into politics right now because right now I'm, I'm a blank. I'm independent. And there's a reason why that is. And that had nothing to do with my my job. It just had to do with me really sort of being in the middle and not wanting to get bogged down on a side. Right. But um I'll tell you what happened to me. I hear a child out in the hallway right now having a hard time. Um, what happened do you, to me? Do you was, want to pause? You can pause with no, me. No, no, she's with somebody. I know I know who the student is. She has her moments and she just she she just needs her time and she needs to be able to vent. Um, that's knowing your students, right? Yeah. Um, I know exactly who it is. Love it. I was at a legislative luncheon a couple of weeks ago and I took a picture with a congressman and um I got a lot of hate for it on Twitter. Hmm. Really? Why? Why do you no, think? Because I, I know exactly why, because 
there are people who have some views different than he does. And we're in education and there might be some things that he thinks about in education that might not align with people in education. But because you took a picture? Yes. Okay. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Yeah. As a district leader, as a school leader, you have to cohort with all types of people. And they may have different views from you, but it's super important that he hears what I have to say and what the needs are, um, because I'm one of his constituents, we're his constituent. And that was important. And we had some great conversation. And even though we have some things that are not in common, we have a lot that's in common. So we can work towards those things to better our schools and our community. I think that's so important, right? And it wasn't just because I took a picture. So I will say this, I took a picture and it was posted and I was really proud that I was really not proud that I was with him, but proud that I was at this forum and voicing some things and talking to my colleagues and, you know, some other legislators. I I turned off the comments because it was starting to get a little ugly in my comments. So I turned it off because I just don't want to be privy to that. It has nothing to do with me wanting to hide anything. It's just that I don't want that I just don't want to be privy to it. So I got a little bit of hate for that, but, and then it died down. It was really like one or two people. It wasn't a lot because the loud people are usually few. Right. Yeah. But um, just knowing the importance of relationships, even relationships with people that we don't always see eye to eye with on every subject. And the key to being successful as a leader and leading some of the work that we have to do, right. Is being able to talk to various people, having conversations that are sometimes difficult And so that brings me right back to having conversations that are difficult, not just with people that we have to network with, but conversations that we have to have with people within our own school communities that may be sometimes difficult to move them forward in a direction that we want to go. But you have to do it in a way that that will allow them to hear you because you also, you know, we work with people that you need to be on board somehow. With that being said, is everybody going to be on board? You're always going to have some people who may resist but they're going to either have to follow along or get left behind. Hmm, that's a difficult choice to make too. And at what point do you stop? What time, what point do you realize they're not going to follow what you would like? And even though you need them, they are not coming. So how do you handle that? Yeah. So that's continued conversation. Sometimes it's, you know, maybe this isn't working out for us. You know, maybe you need to look into other options because right now what we're going to do is what's best for kids and what's best for staff. So make no bones about it. Like I care about kids and I, at the end of the day, I'm making decisions based on what's best for kids, but I also have to make decisions based on what's best for our whole school community. So that includes our staff and faculty, right? So it's everybody, because at the end of the day, if you want SEL to work, whatever that looks like, because I'm, I'm, I'm using that as a big blanket, right? SEL, you have to have everybody have buy-in, but you also have, everybody has to be able to form relationships. It's all about relationships at the end of the day. None of this works. You're not going to be a successful teacher in the classroom if you don't form relationships with students. Everybody has seen the famous TED Talk by Rita Pyerson, right? So kids don't learn from people they don't like. And I'm going to hear to tell you that that is true. Yes. And one of the greatest compliments I've ever been given as an educator was when a parent told me, you're our Rita Pyerson. And I thought, oh, thank you. Like, that's great. Right? Yes, I that understand is great. that. Yeah. Don't tell, there's nothing better that you could tell me, right? Is that yeah. you get kids or you understand kids and you understand families. And it's the whole, it's the whole unit. You know, we're not, it's, it's about kids and families and community. The school is a community. Yeah. So it's everybody involved. Um, teachers, yeah. students, staff, and kids. Well, you're absolutely right. And those conversations can be really difficult. So how do you approach those difficult conversations, Michelle? So they're not hard for me. <laughs> Just so you know, I actually, and I think it's because I was an English teacher and I love to debate, right? I love having hard conversations, especially if they're going to help somebody be a better version of themselves. Right. So you look at you like the challenge of it or do you because you feel like you can reach them? Is that where some of that confidence comes from? Both. Yes, both. Um, It's not hard for me. It really isn't because, you know, I my my former superintendent, one of the things he told me um, he was evaluating me. He goes, one thing I know you can do is have hard conversations. Right. So and I, I took that as a compliment because when I when, a lot of people will think of hard conversations is like that's a bad thing. Hmm. And I think we have to take that, that has to, like, that has to end, right? It doesn't have to be a a hard conversation could be just a conversation where you really give somebody the opportunity to reflect on their practice. So sometimes that hard conversation really starts with some questions 
And then hopefully you get people thinking about their practice and what they can do to maybe be better or what they can do. Sometimes that conversation is with somebody who you think can help somebody else as well. Like I think it's really important to leverage your people. So if you have people who are really strong or really good at something, you have to sort of bring them along and create that leaders in them to help them grow other people. That's super important. I know when I was a teacher in the classroom, if a, if my principal came to me or another colleague came to me and they sought my advice, that felt good. I wanted to share that, right? So I think it's also, as a leader, you realize the leaders amongst your team who can also help bring that along. It's not ever about me. It's not ever about one person. It's about what we can do as a school community. In fact, one of my favorite things to do is to, to put people in a role and watch them go watch them shine and watch them do the work that I know they can do because I can't be and do everything. So. Wow. I mean, I think so many people have been managed, not managed by, but tried to be led by others who wanted to micromanage them or were so insecure in their role as a leader that they couldn't trust their staff. And it sounds like you really do have the trust of your staff or at least know how to gain that, right? Which is a, a, a skill again. So if other superintendents or district leaders who aspire to be, you know, in a, in a larger role, what, if they're listening right now, what would you share with them from a social justice perspective? Because we are looking out for kids and their mental health and well-being and staff. What would you share with them? What do you think they should start doing or pursuing now? So when you say social justice, I'm not sure, like, I need a little more. I know there's so much to it. I know. know, know, Okay. When I think of equity, here's what I will tell you. And I share a little video clip uh, when I do my present. Actually, I'll probably share it tonight at the board. Uh, I have my budget hearing tonight. So I like to talk about equity, right? So social justice, equity, really, it's about, it's honestly, at the end of the day, it's about opportunity. Every kid's having an opportunity. I want to say leveling the playing field, but just really giving them the opportunity to be successful and what that looks like. And not every kid is going to get there the same way. So when I say equity, I think of differentiated instruction, universal design for learning. Like, what are you doing in your classroom to reach every kid? Because if I walk in your classroom and I see that the kids are working on packets every day, how the hell are you reaching kids? I'm sorry, I said hell. (laughs) it's okay how are you reaching kids right (laughs) how are you you know i just read for the first time and this book has been out for 20 years have you read the the book fish no i have not oh my gosh so i can't think of the four elements but one of the elements is play that you have to incorporate play in everything you do and that is so me like i'm excited to be at work i love being at work i play my off my music a little too loud in my office and my secretary (laughs) loves it because she loves the kind of music i listen to I am just truly happy because I make sure that I am playing parts of my day, right? So whether it's playing, I'm listening to music, whether it's running out in the hallway and talking to kids, sneaking into a classroom and asking them what's the best part of their day, like incorporating fun and play. Every class should have fun and play in it every day. So, you know, I just, that's super important is that you're having fun and you you give kids access to learning when they're having a good time. So they can't be sitting in their seats all day. I don't care what grade they're in. They can't be filling out packets all day. And you can't be lecturing at them all day. They have to have access to their learning, which means they've got to be involved. Yeah, I love that too, because if if we all know what we know about child development and kids, and I think sometimes we just need to have more classes for teachers on child development, by yes. the way. Right. And and anyone who's teaching a sixth through twelfth grader, we've got to teach them more about the adolescent developing brain. Just to got to throw that in there uh, because it is unique. It is unique. And play is important even for staff, even for adults. So it's so important that you said that. So let's let's do this, Michelle, because, you know, we could take this about 5000 different ways. Uh, it is a big topic, but I do want to keep honing in on your perspective um, with that equity as opportunity. Let's let's kind of roll this out and finish up with how do you envision your district? How do how does what does that look like, feel like, sound like when equity truly is at play? So what does it look like? It's it's gonna be it's gonna look a little chaotic, actually. How so? Right? So um if you are talking about equity within the classroom, you're gonna see kids 
teachers as the facilitators, we've all heard this, this is nothing new to learning and kids being inquisitive and questioning and problem solving, hands-on, thinking, working together, solving a problem, right? Um, so it's, 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 not, it's not sitting still, it's having access. However, I have two children of my own, one who wants you to just tell him what he needs to do and give him a little checklist and he's going to go through it and he's going to get A's and he's going to do really well. Mm -hmm. And then I have another, uh, another child, my daughter, who really needs that hands-on learning. She needs to be able to touch things. She's tactile. She needs to be able to figure things out. She needs puzzles. That's how she learns. My son, he's very book smart, wrote memorization, and that's what works for him. That was me. That was me. I could sit in a lecture and probably enjoy it because I was a little nerdy but that doesn't work for everybody. So a classroom that truly is equitable has all types of different ways for students to access their education. Op they have options. They have options. It's not just one way. It's how you show your learning. You know, I had a, a superintendent one time who actually was a special ed teacher years ago said, you know what? I had a student who couldn't write, but I knew he knew the material. So right. one day I just brought him in my office and I went through, I, he gave this kid the task. He had a test, right? It was a written test and the kid just couldn't get it on paper. So the, the child just verbalized and showed, showed him that he could do the things that he wanted him to do on the test. And he gave him a different option of how to take the test. That's what I'm talking about. Like kids need to be able to show you what they know, not always in a traditional manner, in a way that makes sense to them because they may know it, but they don't know how to verbalize it or they don't know how to write it down. They need options. Um, you know, so I'm a big fan of portfolios. I did portfolios in the classroom for a long time. I think that should be a great, when we go through teacher's college, that's the culminating project for most of us is a portfolio, right? It is it's yeah. not a test. Right. It's a portfolio of learning. Um, so we just need to be able to, and I have to tell you, I'm surprised at how many teachers I see, not here in my district, but anywhere who still are in that like old school mentality of learn this, take the test. And we really have to get away from that. And I, I feel like this is an old thing I'm talking about and everybody knows this. I don't know. And I think the pandemic has a lot to do with that because it was a lot of packets. It was a lot of remote learning. And so we yes. came back from that and that's what we knew for a year, a lot of us. And so we just haven't switched it up. And one thing we should have learned from that is that the old way doesn't really work. You know, the yes. problems that we have today are not new problems. You said that. They're not new problems. They just have really been brought to the surface or put to the forefront because of what we had been through for the last few years. So now we have to tackle them in a way that's very different. And that means options. I'm not necessarily a big fan of, of remote learning, but I do know this, for some kids it works. And I had a cohort of students in my old school who excelled because we had put the right people in place to do that remote piece for them. So we were open all year, but we did have, you know, we did have to have that option. Um, and the teachers were phenomenal. Yeah. So it's giving them the right, the right up, op giving opportunity to kids. And then totally. it sounds like we need to give staff opportunity, um, to, and I know because I'm a former teacher, if yeah. I had more time and more space to yeah. actually roll these things out and adjust my teaching, I would have more often. Right. So I do believe that part of leadership is figuring out if we're going to make some adjustments to education, we've got to figure out how we're going to make adjustments to schedules to allow teachers time and space who are passionate and willing to do it, to learn how to adapt and make education. Great. I think that's yeah. not just one more thing on their plate, yes. but a tool and a way to access that tool. And yeah, they do need time. They ask for time. They do. They do. But then, but then you can't always provide that. So it's, it's about how are we going to manage that differently in a, in a productive way, but a realistic way so that we're not constantly dumping on educators either on teachers yeah. in the classroom who really want to make that difference. And that's why people like you have a really tough job. I think these days, because you want yeah. to do that for them, but it is challenging. And we also want to do everything. Like I have, <laughs> I have all these things, right? You should see my whiteboard in my office, all these things that we're starting to initiate. Yeah. And I have to remember, you know, I had a former superintendent that said, tell me when to put my slippers on, right? I'm re referencing all these great leaders that came before me because I learned so much from them yeah. because you have to also know when to just slow down and, you know, because you don't want to crash and burn because we can do that to ourselves as leaders by expecting too much. But, you know, you and I talked before the segment about how it's really, I'm really, I try to be very purposeful in my time and modeling the importance of taking time for myself as well. 
Yeah, that is such, it really is great leadership when you can model that and actually give permission for that to happen. Yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, Michelle, I do want to honor your time. Like I said, I would. Is there anything else that you would like to share with people? Let them know, you know, to look out for you, to connect with you. Anything else you'd like to share? Um, Please do, because I have to tell you, I have met so many wonderful people through platforms like this, yourself included. Um, you know, I have learned so much from others. It's really important. I would give new leaders this advice to network. I have a great network within my region, but it's also important to get a lens from those outside of your region, outside of your area, to just give you a different perspective. Because sometimes the trends in our own region or our own communities, you know, might sort of stronghold us. And it's it's good to get out there and see what other people are doing. My mentor is from Long Island, from a very large district, and she's amazing and phenomenal. And I've learned so much about my leadership and how to be a great leader from her. Um, so it's really important to make those connections because this is a very, it can be a very lonely job. It's not for me because I'm not going to let it be that way. I'm meeting Charlie Peck and Darren Pepper and Andrew Narada. <laughs> I'm meeting all these wonderful people because I put myself out there because it helps me. Right. Well, I can tell. And you know what? You've created such a positive energy that is, uh, it's so nice to be around. It really is, Michelle. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you so much for having me. Yes. And and truly, if anybody would like to reach out to Michelle, clearly, Michelle, you're open to that. And where would they reach out to you? Um, so honestly, the best place to reach out to me is probably Twitter. Yeah. And it's my first initial last name, Mosterhout at Twitter, at Mosterhout. Um, and you can message me and I'll give you my contact information. I'm on Twitter quite a bit. I've, I've met lots of people on Twitter. You and I communicate on Twitter. It's been a great resource for PD and just connecting with people. Agreed. Agreed. I am in that same network and I love it. It's true. It's true. Okay. So I'll put that in the notes and thank you again, Michelle, for being here. I appreciate you so, so much. I appreciate you, leadership. Charlie. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And everybody just please listen up um, to this and share this, share this with other people who would benefit from hearing this information. Thank you all so much for being here.